Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, good evening to you. A couple of months ago, a 14-year-old schoolboy in Brisbane was banned for 10 years after he was reported for wielding an iron bar in a junior football match. Now, that's not an isolated example. In Sydney, a 15-year-old boy was charged with criminal assault after he was sent off for punching another player during a soccer game. That's the sort of thing that's going on in the name of sport. Now, if you have any doubt about that, just go through the law list sometime. It's very revealing. You see there where the juniors get their example. I just quote a couple of cases at random. The Darwin Magistrates Court. A footballer fined $2,000 for assaulting another player. The Adelaide uh, District Court, another footballer, awarded $700,000 for permanent facial damage after he was elbowed in the side of the face. The South Australian Supreme Court, a footballer again, found guilty of assaulting another player. Uh, the list just goes on. Well, the National Committee on Violence is so concerned about what's happening in sport now, it's conducting an investigation. And this is the sort of thing it's looking at. Spiteful Olympic qualifying match against Israel in New Zealand that McDowell lost control and delivered the kick to the head that's left him down for the count. There was plenty of spite in the match and this early incident set the pace for what was to come later. Even the referee was lost in the huddle of brawling players. Well, that's the sort of thing we see in our television sets every other week and that's what so concerns the National Committee on Violence. Well, its recommendations won't be out until the end of the year, but today it released this interim report and it makes a number of important points in this. It says Australians are far too ready to excuse violence in sport as just part of the rough and tumble and different to violence anywhere else in the community. And the committee poses a very good question in this. It says, why should sport be an open invitation for assault? Why shouldn't the criminal law apply in sport like it does anywhere else? You see, I can go onto a football field or a, a, a soccer game and punch and kick and attack do almost anything and the worst that'll happen to me is that I might be sent off or perhaps suspended for a couple of games. Now if I walk off that oval and do exactly the same thing out in the street I'd have to face the full force of the law. Now why should it be any different? Well the committee thinks it shouldn't be different. It thinks the police should be involved. So what do we do? Do we hand it over to the law or do we leave the policing to the sporting bodies themselves? Well just before we talk about that I think we should perhaps talk about the problem itself. Uh, let's go to Daryl Broman up in Sydney first. Now, Daryl, you've had your jaw broken. Sure, you took okay. action against the player who broke your jaw. Uh, how do you feel about this? Well, personally, I believe uh, uh, there's no need for the police to be involved in it. Um, I think there is a need for the sporting bodies to look to control the violence on the field. And let me say this before we start: I think the, the sporting bodies have done it in rugby league, in particular, which is the sport I was involved in. I think they've done a fairly good job over the last 10 years or so in policing the violence. All right, well, look, we'll, we'll get onto that in just a moment. Just tell us how you got your jaw broken. Just tell us about the incident. Um, I was playing in a state of origin game, rugby league, in uh, 1983. Uh, I had the football, I was running with the football, and I was elbowed in the, uh, in the face and uh, broke my jaw. That was basically and you, you actually, it never actually went to court because you made a settlement out of court, didn't you? But That's was, right. it, uh, was it clearly established that that was just a deliberate act of violence? Well, it was that, that, I suppose, has never been clearly established uh, because it didn't go to court, but uh, uh, in my opinion it was, and uh, it certainly did cost me some money through missing out on uh, playing football well, for quite a, a period of time. it cost you a broken jaw, cost you a broken jaw, didn't it? Yeah, well, that, that's, that's true. Uh, you know, also, I believe, you know, when you go onto a football field, um, injuries are probably part and parcel of the game, but I also believe that uh, if it is... Um, uh, probably out, outside the laws of the game to a certain extent, I think you should have uh, an option of uh, taking some legal action yourself. All right. Well, uh, Matt Rendell, you've had your share of injuries, haven't you? I mean, how often do you see deliberate violence? Um, not real um, injuries from violence. <coughs> probably the worst I had was a dislocated shoulder, but um, no facial inju injuries or anything like that. I've been in plenty of skirmishes, but... Uh, I don't see much uh, physical violence on a, on a football field, a um, Victorian Football League football field at all. But when you go out there, are you, are you, are you expecting, uh, I mean, do you expect violence? You don't expect violence, you expect body contact. Um, <clears throat> you don't expect uh, um, to get king hit or, or anything like that. And I think uh, you take a fair risk not playing the game and I suppose it comes down to the, 
the old uh, car crash syndrome, you never think it's going to happen to you. You might see it happen to someone else, but you always think you're too smart and, it's, and you're not going to get cleaned up. Yeah, I mean, there seem to be plenty of examples of it, though. I mean, we've showed a couple there and there are plenty more, too. We had, we had a big choice in the film library. Well, there was also a lot of games played as well. I think uh, it, the amount of bad incidents that happened are minimal of, of how many games and, and, uh, that are played over a year. <coughs> mm. Peter Quinn, you wrote, uh, you're a member of this National Committee on Violence and you wrote one of the initial reports. Perhaps you should just explain why the committee saw violence in sport as enough of a problem to justify a, a special study, a number of reports and some recommendations. Well, Peter, in the first place it was part of our terms of reference. But I think um, one of the things about it is that it seems to me in recent years there's been a, a myth emerged that there's a permissible level of violence in sport. Uh, so you've got things like the opening biff. Everybody says, well, that's all right. We know it's part of the game. It's got to be there. Um, I think uh, we would take issue with that. We would much rather see games played on, on a skill basis rather than having to soften up the opponent first, um, that sort of thing. Yeah. You see, um, uh, Daryl Broman, who's there with you. I mean, Daryl, is it true that the, uh, that the player who broke your jaw said to you, uh, I meant to hurt you, but I didn't mean to break your jaw? Yes, he did say that, Peter. He said that to me uh, about 10 minutes after it happened, actually. Mm. He, uh, I was off the field with my broken jaw and uh, he'd been sent to the sin bin for uh, 10 minutes and he came into the dressing shed and he said that to me. But doesn't yeah. that indicate to you that there's something wrong somewhere? With regards to what the game... Well, a player who goes out there says, I meant to hurt you. You're well, playing a game of football. We are playing a game of football, but I believe, you know, just Peter just mentioned the fact that the, the biff in the first 10 minutes or whatever of a game of football... You very rarely see that these days. I'm talking about rugby league again, and excuse me for, I'm not trying to generalise, but I'm talking about rugby league. You often see, uh, you see the hard tackles and the big hits in, in rugby league, but uh, with regards to, to uh, all-in brawls in rugby league, it's very rare that that happens now. Mm. Peter Quinn, perhaps you should just explain for us, perhaps you should just define exactly what we're talking about here. I mean, what do you, what do you call excessive violence? I guess, too, we're talking about the body contact sports, aren't we? I mean, what is excessive violence? If it happens within the code of the game, within the rules, is that OK? And if it happens outside the code, is that then excessive violence? What's your definition? Well, I think it's part of a, a much wider picture of, um, of people being deliberately involved in creating a violent situation. Um, you've got the phenomenon of sledging that's going on in lots of sports, not only football. Um, you've got the use of professional motivators, uh, people who are employed to hype up the teams, to uh, get them on a psychological high, uh, so that they will um, use violent means on field. Mm. How much, just to go back to the, our, our group here, I mean, how much of this is acceptable? F Phil well, Cleary. Well, any, any incident involving violence is... Uh, something we should be worried about but once again as Matt said generally there's so much sport played and you take a couple of examples and throw them up as if they're the rule I don't think the uh, essentially sport or football for instance the code I play isn't about violence and we heard uh, suggestions there that you motivate players around violence I don't think you do I think you motivate players around the ideas of courage selflessness cooperation and those sorts of things which are virtuous things you don't ask players to act violently you ask them to act with courage but you see, already people here have virtually borne out the comment that the National Committee had to make in its report here, that we somehow regard it as acceptable if it happens in sport. I mean, you're all talking about a few biffs in the first half no, hour we're as being not, acceptable. No, we're not saying a few it's biffs acceptable. A punch in the face, isn't no, it? we're not saying it's acceptable. We're saying it's very rare, and when it happens, it's dealt with by the administrators. And the rules are becoming stricter and stricter. We now have trial by video. The administrators are very careful in Australian rules, for instance, to clean the game up because games like basketball have an appearance of being clean. So the administrators think, well, we better make football cleaner so we have stricter rules and the parents won't be as worried about it. Well, Neville Turner, you're concerned about this, aren't you? I mean, how serious do you think this problem is? Well, I think it's quite artificial for sports people to say that the police should not be involved. The fact is that it is a criminal offence to assault another person, whether it's on the field or off the field. And going right back to the 19th century, there was a case in which a player, a footballer, was killed on the field and the, uh, the assailant was, was held liable for manslaughter, was in fact convicted for manslaughter. And it's not just a question of criminal uh, uh, law, it is also the question of the civil law. Right. So that a person who is injured, particularly if he's a professional footballer or any other sportsman, who's on, whose wife 
is, is left without an income, who has a mortgage to keep, that, sort, that person is entitled to sue. And uh, the fact that it's on the sporting field does not give, it a, give a license to uh, assaulting activity, which otherwise would be criminal mm -hmm. or civil, uh, give rise to civil action. Ron Barassi. Well, don't you think uh, the police have got enough to do? The police have a duty Isn't there more to important things than that? The police have a duty to prosecute crime wherever it's committed. Uh, Let's assault, just, assault, I, you mean. I, I just want to establish very clearly, first of all, whether we've got a serious problem here or whether the National Committee on Violence is overestimating it all. I mean, what do you all think? Yeah, Leon Wigger. Well, it's, uh, I think it's, a, it's, it's criminal that the criminologists have got involved with sport, and uh, most sports these days are very well looked after. Uh, by the amount of officials that we've got running around on the field. In the case of Australian rules, for instance, two field umpires, an emergency, two goal umpires, two uh, boundary umpires, plus the video, are all looking at that action 100% of the time. And I just think that it's just really going over the top for this committee, whoever they might be, and nobody in sports know, even knows the people. I, I just think it's going right over the top to try and build up this case as if we've got people slaughtering each other all over the place. Well, look, perhaps, 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 I should, perhaps I just show, should show another example. Oh, you'll you'll to... find plenty of examples. But if you look well, have a look at enough. this one. I mean, this will give you some idea on why the National Committee on Violence thought there was perhaps a case to answer. This is from a, this is from a league test match that was played in Brisbane uh, back in uh, 1983, I think it was. This is between Australia and New Zealand. New Zealand, as to as Ricky Cowan. Dowling and Temity are sent to the sin bin to cool off, but that appears to have been the last thing on their minds and insults were exchanged all the way to the fence. Oh, now there's a fight on the two of them. They're into it over on the touchline. Both men were hurt in a fight, a fight that simply shouldn't have happened, and a fight that ruined a marvellous game. Their punishment doesn't fit the crime. They've been suspended by their respective leagues for eight days. There you go. Eight day suspension. Now, how about, I mean, yeah, that's, 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 that's a, a lot, an out and out that, brawl. That's, in that's not sport. Roy Masters. Well, it was six years ago for a start, and I believe in that period there's been a massive uh, realisation by our administrators that uh, a lot of incidents need to be cleaned up. You've, we've had trial by video in rugby league in Sydney since uh, the late 70s. Uh, the VFL have taken it aboard. The lawyers are getting into the courts all the time. The case with regard to Darrell, the injury that uh, Darrell suffered, that guy who was responsible for his injury told me the other day it cost him 200000 bucks. I mean, there's a realisation in all of society now that uh, with lawyers coming in, with administrators coming in, with, uh, with <coughs> clear-cut medical evidence, uh, everywhere we've got to clean our act up, and I believe our administrators have. That's You're going back six years to find something. Rex Mossop wants to say something. Rex, yeah, you... I'm fed up with uh, a lot of this talk. It's, a lot of it's garbage, you know. That, uh, the commentator on the end of that bit of footage there said it spoiled what was a good game. I don't think anyone that was at the game thought it was spoiled. It was two guys, two big men. They've been in the thick of a test match representing their countries and they got stuck into it on the way off. Now, I don't condone it, but I know how the adrenaline can pump and how you can get involved. Let me give you a few statistics on rugby league at the moment. We'll talk about, we'll talk about roughness and dirty play, if you like. Rugby league has got a self-regulating system right at this particular moment. They must have a tough judiciary, which we've got. We had a fellow by the name of Jim Comins who brought in draconian penalties. One player, I remember getting 45 matches for a particular uh, assault that he did on another player. This is some years ago. And uh, now we've got a fellow by the name of Dick Conti. We go through the videotapes. All the players are represented by solicitors. Everyone gets a very fair go. I don't think anyone that's gone through before the judiciary can possibly think that they've had been hardly done by. Let me tell you a few things about the Winfield Cup, which is a 16-team competition that we have going around up here. We've got a team from Brisbane, we've got from, uh, from Canberra, we go down to Newcastle, we've got them from all over the place, 16 teams. Now, of those 16 teams, they run a first reserve and under-21 side every week. That's 36 players, three lots of 13, 36, plus replacements about maybe 44, 45 players on a weekend get a run. That's roughly 700 players. 700 players go around every weekend. They've played, uh, they play 22 rounds of football, so let me just tell you what the statistic is, and I did this work this out the other day because I realised there'd be some do-gooders that wanted to change the image of rugby league. There is 0.15 of a percent of players sent from the field. 0.15, 0.15, let me reiterate it. That's sent from the field on any given day that there's rugby league played in Sydney in the Winfield Cup. Now, I rest my case. 
Well, Neville Turner then, are we making too much of all this? We are more certainly not making too much of it. The incidence of violence in sport is very great. And in fact, there are more legal cases on the sports page than any part of the newspaper these Aren't days. because the and lawyers have got into the act, Neville. Not That's at all. It's a, it's but, a question of justice. But the lawyers can only get into the act, surely, if they've got something and, to work on. And more significant, of course, is the effect on children, because professional sports people are role models, and the children themselves <laughs> ape the professional sports people. And in fact, the situation is getting so serious that schools are dropping sport, are threatening to drop sport because of the risk of damages actions to the tune of $2 million. And this, of course, surely must reflect on the professional sportsman's attitude, uh, the, who really is, first and foremost, a role model for children. But you see, we're just talking about the incidents that we see on television. I mean, they're the star games. I think Peter Larkin, you're a, you, you deal in sports medicine, don't you? I mean, I think you'd probably make the point, wouldn't you, that most of the violence we never see because it's going on in district games and junior games and, and well, so on. I think it's, it's all well and good, Peter, to talk about what's happened at the top rugby league level and the VFL level where we have got two umpires on the field, where there are two boundary umpires at every game and where there is a reserve umpire who now runs onto the field and stops the melee behind the play. And in fact, that's not the case that's happening in the real sports world out there in the community. That's not what happens at country games. Quite often there is just a single central umpire. There's certainly no reserve umpire. There is no video. And players are well aware of what they can get away with in those games. And in fact, in terms of the medical component of it, obviously there are incidents there arising well behind the play or outside the rules of the play that are, would be considered violent in any other context if it wasn't on the field. We all know that those body collision sports are, are allowed to have physical aggression. And if you're going to play that sport, you know you're going to be crunched. Mm. Matt Rindell said that. Mm. But in fact, you don't expect to get hit behind the play. You don't expect to get king hit. And, of course, where you know you're not going to be caught because there isn't the surveillance at 99% of the, of the body collision sports that are being played, the adequate surveillance, I'm saying, then, of course, you know you'll get away with it. Mm. Ron Barassi, what do you think? Are we making too much of this? Uh, we are, but I think all points are uh, equitable. Well, everyone's got a, a good point here. But what has happened over the years but because the game, each competition has been run by a representative from the clubs and no one up at the top having an overall view, they've all had to be forced into their decisions on players uh, uh, being suspended through their own club interest. Club interest has ruled both rugby league and Australian football from what I can understand, certainly Australian football. Now they're getting some independent people and they are aware of the community interest, they have the wider view and they are bringing in much tougher measures, as Roy has said, and uh, the Sydney guys have said, uh, the game is being much more better judged now. Whether it goes down to the bottom level or not, that's a whole, that's yeah, a whole the trouble, thing. It's only the star games that have it been is, super They are role models, mm. as, as you said. Yeah. Mm. Let's keep the police out. Let's, let's have a fair go at our sport, a decent go at our sport in, in this new uh, area, in this new period. And if after, say, five years, then let the police come in. The police, surely they've got tons of other things to do. Surely it's the last thing they want. Yeah. So what, if we can do it ourselves, let us have a, a go at it. That's my thing. Yeah, but of course some people are going to argue that you haven't been doing it yourselves. Look, I, want to, I just want to talk to Jeff Gerrard for a moment. I mean, Jeff, I think you say uh, that uh, we're being far too sensitive, that, uh, that body contact sports are rough games and you have to expect this. <coughs> well, you know, I've just retired. I've, I've been playing 17 years at the top level in Sydney and you know, Daryl's a good friend of mine, and I've got to say that I don't believe in taking anything off the field that happens on the field, uh, you know, with solicitors coming in and all the lawsuits. I, I believe most people get there because they're skillful, skillful at a game, and, you know, the violence, I think it's something that just happens. It's not so much violence, it's, it's ruggedness that comes out in people. There. Well, that wasn't ruggedness we saw in that example I showed a few moments ago. I mean, those guys were slugging it out, and what did they get? Eight days suspension. It's a joke. Well, I, I think the way you, you hurt sportsmen is not let them play their sport. And uh, I know, you know, most of the fellows I've played with, they get hurt by hitting them in the pocket and not letting them play their sport. And believe me, most of them learn their lessons. They, they yeah, don't but you go see, you're all it. saying, oh, yeah, we can handle it ourselves. But, I mean, that one example alone was evidence that uh, the sporting bodies aren't handling it. You know, that, that was I'll just a straight wrong, assault sorry, we saw then. <clears> I can't agree with that. That incident, as was stated, was over six years ago. Now, but does I, it matter? I've been, a, I've been a rugby league referee for 30 years, since the age of 14, and all over Australia. Now, I'm not at the top level, I'm not uh, top level Sydney, but in Victoria, where rugby league isn't even recognised, uh, we, we have to take our hat off and compliment the administration of the Australian Rugby League for their initiatives, particularly in the last 10 years. The introduction of the sin bin, 
the introduction of accreditation for all coaches, and we've introduced that down here where no, no team takes a field unless they have a fully accredited coach. And now the introduction of Aussie sports. Now, if this isn't a way of the code administrating yourself, our, our, our game has improved out of sight here in Victoria in the last three years. Let me just throw this open a bit. Oh, I mean, I uh, are we making too much of it, do you think? Are we getting too well, sensitive about what sh should or should not happen in what is essentially a pretty rough game? I agree with what Rex Mossop said. Too many do-gooders. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. What's violence and what's aggression? I think a lot of people are getting aggression mixed up with violence. Sure, those acts you showed on the TV were, was violence. That was but not in, in rugby league and Australian football, it's aggressive sports. And to put a, a blanket over it all and call it all violence when a lot of it's just good, hard, aggressive contact football, I think wrong. I think these people that are saying that there's too much violence, I want to see the statistics and I want to know where were there, where did they get the figures from, you know? How many people did they talk to? Mm. Yeah. Peter Quinn. Well, I think there's been some uh, quite uh, good recent examples of it. For example, in the, in the last State of Origin Rugby League match between Queensland and New South Wales uh, <coughs> in June, um, it was compared to um, Rourke's drift. Um, a whole lot of people were injured in the match. It was absolutely peppered with violence. But Sydney siders would get more concerned about uh, uh, cockfighting than uh, they would about uh, rugby league injuries. Well, Rex Mossop, I think you were inclined to say, aren't you, there's nothing wrong with a punch? I've always believed in a punch, and that's one of the things in, in the era in which I played. Uh, it was could be construed as a fairly dirty game. There was a, a lot of uh, lot of uh, violence in the game. There were a lot of head high tackles. We used to liken it to running through a field of coat hangers. You know, you had to run with your hand up. That's all gone. The last ten years in Sydney <coughs> rugby league, it's been made squeaky clean. There is virtually no violence. There might be an isolated incident <coughs> with some player or other who goes over to, over the top. Somebody says, uh, you know, so and so is a bit of a, a mad dog because he can't handle it. You say, you refer to some players as having poker machine eyes. Their eyes roll around when they get the adrenaline pumping. Well, those sort of people, they've been weeded out. There aren't that many of them in the game. There weren't that many in the first place. And they've been weeded right out. Peter Quinn, do you want to comment on that? Well, I, I think that's all wrong. I mean, um, the State of Origin match, for example, was portrayed by the media as uh, being akin to warfare. Uh, you the, don't the believe everything you read in the papers, <clears throat> well, though, do you? Peter, Peter Quinn, I think in your report, you <clears throat> actually talked about uh, uh, senior footballers, staff footballers, as being professional mercenaries. You made the yes, direct comparison. I think they are. I think that uh, part of their employment uh, could well be to be able to injure people without being caught. Oh, no, that's absolute crap. Garbage. That is garbage. There's no player sent out on the football field to injure another player deliberately. <laughs> this bloke had his jaw broken. I was at the ground. I saw the action. I probably may have expected it from the player involved. He was that sort of a player. He was a very violent player. But uh, that was a long while ago, and Daryl Brayman to, uh, w copped it sweet. But that's the way the game was. It's, there's none of that now going on in rugby league. I can't talk about VFL. I don't... What's the game? Mm. OK, let me just bring it back here for a moment. Judy Dixon, you're a member of this National Committee on Violence. Now, it seems to come down to a point of trying to decide how much violence is acceptable on the sporting field. Yes, I think uh, I admired the points that Phil made about uh, players going onto the field uh, with a spirit of uh, courage and fearlessness and fair play and so on. And I think most of us are brought up to believe that's what sport is about. Uh, what concerns some members of the National Committee is this uh, warping of community values where the community is quite happy to observe assaults and bashings and kickings on the sports field and yet if this happened in their suburban street, they would be ringing up the police, they would be writing to the newspapers, they would be contacting their local members of parliament and saying there is terrible violence in the street. Can, you, can any of you involved in sport tell me why this is so? Yes. Well, I wasn't going to say that. I was going to say this as a physical educator, uh, I would find, and I'm very much against violence in sport, I'll say that, but the thing that annoys me is the media pick on things and blow it up and we see it time after time after time. And we look at our role models and our role models are there portraying violence all the time. I think the media have got to accept their responsibilities and not so much direct it back onto the sporting associations. Yeah, but Roy Masters, am I right in saying the media tends to give the public what it wants? <clears throat> well, I can remember a long time ago uh, when, uh, when the violence was, was very heavy in, in Sydney football a guy sent me a poem, and the poem was something along the lines of uh, The media declare its violence we dread. You can savour the scenes in our full colour spread. Mm. And I thought that was it. Well, it did demonstrate a hypocritical attitude. 
the guy in, in Sydney mentioned uh, Rourke's Drift uh, with relation to the, to the State of Origin, the recent State of Origin game. Rourke's Drift has been used in a hackneyed term in journalism to refer to rugby league games ever since those guys were over there in the Boer War. Mm. Uh, in fact, I think the game was only invented about six years look, later. I, I'm just interested to hear why people are prepared to accept violence on the football field that they wouldn't accept in their own street. Do, do you, well, Peter, there was a case today in the courts, a 17-year-old boy who struck an umpire and he was brought before the courts. So, and that happened at an amateur level of sport uh, down at Albert Park uh, last year. And he was suspended for four years and <coughs> uh, received a bond today from the courts. But the fact of the matter is that it's still going on at those junior levels. It's, it's in the attitude that's displayed by people like Rex Mossop. There's a sort of healthy violence and uh, that can be acce a acceptable <laughs> level of violence. <laughs> Whereas uh, in terms of when it gets off the field, nobody wants to accept it. Mm. Yeah, you wanted to make a point, sir? Yeah, I was just... Um, we're still on this thing with violence and aggression. Uh, the only point I'd like to make is these people that say uh, you wouldn't see it on the streets. You get a fight on, say, a football field. How many times out in the streets could you have uh, one bloke, eight or nine stone, come and split the whole thing up? It's, to me, it's controlled aggression most of the time. Mm. Oh, I think Terry, Terry, sorry, we, well, Ron Barassi. I think it's sorry to say it doesn't happen on the streets and not get reported. Yeah, but the point is, there, Ron, there, if, there it happen, if it happens out there mm. in the sporting field, like we saw in that clip yeah. I showed, it's all OK. You get eight days suspension. If you that's did right. that, if you had a brawl like that out in the street, you'd be charged with assault. No, yeah, what, see, that's you where you're wrong. I'd you... say about one, about one in ten brawls that happen out in the public in bars or nightclubs or discos or family barbecues would be... I'd say one in a hundred. <laughs> no. I'd say one in a hundred. No, you do right. have a court, though, but the tribunal acts against those things and it doesn't uh, <coughs> say that they're morally appropriate. It says they're the wrong thing to do, so it's not, not condoning it. The only difference is you're not engaging the state in the activity, and whether you want the state involved in the football is a serious question, uh, probably a philosophical one. Peter Larkins. Peter, it's very interesting the way the, the players who do get injured outside the rules, either the broken noses or the broken jaws, etc., that, that we see in the sports casualty areas, accept that as, as their fate. It's, it's quite interesting. I've seen it time after time where the player says to me, you know, I sort of say, well, how'd this happen? Well, you know, the ball had gone up there and the fellow hit me and I said, well, gee, that, how do you feel about that? He said, well, you know, I'll be back. I'll be back next time and I know who it was. I've got his number. It's part of the game. I, you know, I know I'm playing the game. So that attitude of there, of the, the player participating, going on to that gladiatorial arena. Mm. They know that that's part and parcel of it. It's been there for as long as the sport's been around. And there's an even up process that goes on. We see that at the start of many games where there is that first melee. Look, I just, I don't want to leave Sydney out of this. Uh, Mr. Friedman, Rugby Union, what have you got to say? Well, I, I do believe the tribunal is a little off the track in uh, suggesting the community condones violence on the field. I don't really believe they do. I believe they do rely on the sporting organisations to look after their own and uh, take whatever action is necessary, and certainly in Rugby Union we do. I know Rugby League's done a wonderful job, particularly over the last decade, and uh, we've always had a tradition of supporting referees and uh, you know, sending off players. Players sent off are treated fairly harshly, and uh, we discipline it ourselves, and uh, uh, our fellows play it as amateurs. They play it for enjoyment. There's enough uh, you know, physical requirement without and uh, that sort of brutality. Yeah, but is it, is it, is it seen as a gladiatorial combat? Uh, Roy Masters. Well, I've got a, uh, very quickly a little story which I think demonstrates to some extent that they may be right when they talk about community attitudes to it. During this period of uh, very clean, pure rugby league in Sydney, there was a period in a game that my team, St George, was involved in against South Sydney when there was a, an ugly brawl developed. It went for about uh, two or three minutes, even to the stage where I was starting to feel embarrassed about it. And I can remember thinking to myself, that, and, 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 and then suddenly a boo developed all around the Sydney football stadium. And I, I remember thinking to myself, that's the end of the catharsis theory as far as I'm concerned. You know, if people are booing, they clearly don't want to see this. And so after the game, I said to a couple of players, you know, demonstrates to me beyond any doubt now, you know, people don't go along to, to sport to, to see violence acted out on the field. The players said, you missed the point. The people were booing the fact that the officials of the Sydney football ground turned off the big screen. So the they couldn't see it. They wanted to see two, two views. They wanted to see the real live action there and they wanted to see a big close-up. There was a big replay up on yeah. the screen. Yeah. See, that right. is very revealing. People want to see it. I mean, how do you react to that? 
that then, Judy oh, Dixon? I mean, do people are people really concerned about it, or do they rather you know, who enjoy it? Are you going to blame? Are you going to blame the gladiators out into the field, or are you going to blame the people sitting in the stands? Who want to watch it? Yeah. Peter, don't get confused. I mean. We all love to be around a lot of human energy. It is an argument between two friends, uh, or you go to uh, Parliament during question time and you see a, a, a raucous uh, set up and, and uh, a set to. It's, it's tremendously enjoyable. Most people are fair to themselves. When you go away and you cool down and you look at it objectively, you say, well, what they did up in Parliament there was stupid, and what those people did at the, the, the barbecue was wrong. But whilst you're there, there's enough animal in all of us still that we love it. Don't worry about that. But it doesn't make it right, just the same. And that's what football's got to come to grips with. Everyone loves a set too. But when we cool down, that is not the way to play the game. The game should be played within rules, and there should be things like courage and sportsmanship. Well, I mean, that's and what, that's and what the people National who hit Committee people say. who are, are not ready for it, they are not courageous. But a lot of them have squibs, you know that, don't you? Mm -hmm. They are squibs. If I could just Look. comment on that, uh, Peter, I think... Uh, uh, what you're saying is possibly correct, but I think the community concern for violence in the community is such that we cannot ignore violence in sport. We cannot say there is one particular area where we will have assaults and bashings and kickings and we will ignore that area, even though the community is so concerned that uh, thousands of letters are written about violence in all sorts of areas, that there are calls for more police, more police powers, more money spent on research, and more preventative measures for violence. We can't possibly simply say, well, this one particular little area, we will let uh, the rules be ignored. Mm. Roy Hay, you want to make a point? Yeah. Just, I think the sports courts should be worried about this because they're losing junior players. Mm. Now, whether they're losing them solely because of the violence or for an associated complex of reasons is something we could argue about. But in Melbourne, for example, there are 1,500 fewer junior soccer players playing this year <coughs> than there were five years ago. Australian Rules is very concerned that it's losing people at the 16 to 18 year old age group. They're drifting out of the game. Now, one of the reasons for this is violence. It's not the only reason, but people perceive that the level of violence on the field has got too high to be comfortable at junior sport levels. Mm. Now, I, think, I think we should look at what lies behind this and then talk about whether it's just aggression, whether it's violence or whether it's just aggression that gets out of control. I want to just show you a brief clip here. Uh, this, this is taken from a 60 Minutes program that George Negus did with the famous Jacko a few years ago. And in a few words, Jacko, I think, in this piece, sums up the feeling that a lot of players have when they go out there on the field and he sort of, in a sense, talks of, I think illustrates this sort of gladiatorial uh, feeling that uh, I think a lot of players must have when they go out to play a game. If a coach said to me, like, you know, I've never got this licence, but I know of players that have got the licence to go out and just go bang, king hit some bloke, I'd love to get that licence. Because, you know, I'd really do a good job. He probably wouldn't get up for a while. He wouldn't get up, he'd be sucking out of a straw for about three months. Now, how about that? He wouldn't get up for a while, he'd be sucking out of a straw for no, three months. Peter, now, I, right. coached, I coached that guy, and that guy is a showman, and he's made a lot of money. He was a very ordinary footballer who made the most of his football talents and finally finished up being tipped out of three clubs for not being good enough footballer. He's made a lot of money out of being a showman. So don't get sucked in by that yeah. as the norm. No, That's but Ron, fair. Ron, that, that is not alone, and we're not just... <laughs> we're not, we're, don't you wave your finger at me, so... Uh, but it's not just football we're singling out here either, because Dennis Lilly's got a quote in his book, and this is straight from the record. I mean, Dennis Lilly said, uh, and I'm quoting, I try to hit a batsman in the rib cage when I bowl a purposeful bouncer, and I want it to hurt so much that the batsman doesn't want to face me anymore. Not many batsmen recover from a really good bouncer. Now that, that's cricket. Could that be just macho dribble, you know, someone sounding off after the event? Is that really what he was? Doesn't he want to get wickets as well? well isn't my that point the essence is... of the game? And is he, maybe he's just skylarking like Jackson, just being silly about it and just showmanship, hardly worth talking about. But surely we're talking about the attitude that underlines sporting events here, aren't we? Yeah, Leon, we But there are rules, and I think we control this thing much better than the police could ever do. And I think the committee, with great respect to them, have missed the bus entirely. We have, in fact, Ron was wrong too before, we have independent tribunals. They're, they're, they're nothing to do with the VFL, they're inde independent. And the, league, and the league up in Sydney are the same. These people do their thing absolutely independent of all other things. And the thing that they're better than the ordinary courts uh, in, is that if they get 10 weeks, they serve 10 weeks. Mm -hmm. Now, if the police take action, they're going to get out with a bond and they'll be playing next week. 
Peter yeah, Russell Peter. in Sydney from the Peter. National uh, Soccer Federation. I mean, would you yeah. like to pick up on this? Yes, we, in soccer, we have our own tribunals as well. We have them in Melbourne and in Sydney. And they're basically um, based solely on solicitors and barristers who, uh, who are independent from the clubs. They deal out uh, penalties just the same as the, uh, the rugby league and uh, Yeah, but, but Peter, just let me interrupt you a minute. We're not talking about whether the tribunals are effective here. We're talking about whether the whole problem is the attitude that underlines these games, this sort of gladiatorial approach. Well, certainly not in soccer. We, uh, that's not the, the case in soccer. Soccer is basically a skill game. Mm. Um, there's not so much physical contact as there may be in the other sports. But I, uh, I don't think that uh, the coaches uh, necessarily encourage their players to be violent when they go on the field. I think they're more interested in getting on with the game and scoring tries or uh, goals, whatever the case may be. Mm. Let, let me think... just go to some of the coaches well, here. I mean, Roy Masters, uh, Phil Cleary, uh, Ron Barassi. I mean, you're all coaches or former coaches. I well, mean, how much psyching up goes on? Well, my, my side was the premiership side in the VFA last year. We're playing off again in the grand final. The grand final last year, VFA, no drama at all. Well, there's plenty of drama, no violence. And I would imagine next Sunday will be the same. You yes, side sure, players... no violence last Sunday, but you, n none of you are really talking about the sort of attitude that's been described by Jacko's comments and by Dennis Lilly's yeah, comments. But Jackson exactly. isn't worth, Peter. Jackson talks rubbish. I mean, why consider the point? I mean, it's just showmanship. That yes, coaching is about organising... It's organizing easy to write it off as showmanship, but you're writing the... Dennis Lilly off as showmanship. <laughs> well, I mean... Can I, that... I give you another one, Phil? Hey, this is from guys? John Snow, the English fast bowler. He said, I'm not afraid of leaving a trail of fractures among the opposition. That's what I'm oh, there for. Well, not uh, to inflict deliberate injury of course but to rough up a batsman I never let them forget the game is played with a very hard ball bar room, bar room talk that's all it is and men well, how many more do I have to give you you just said that he, he doesn't intend to do damage I mean you, you don't believe that statement by him in other words is it's that a correct? very uh, well it, no I do I do I will accept it it's on the record I think I the, 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 the pitch bowling is a blight on the world's most beautiful game and in fact it's, it's just a matter of time before a batsman yeah. gets killed as you and Chapman or Chatfield nearly did in 1973. I, I'm just interested, I'm just really wanting to talk here specifically about the attitude that this demonstrates. And this shows that cricket hasn't been able to clean its act up mm. internally. Let's, let's yes. ask the question here, Peter. If we suggest that any physical contact sport which does call for a hard hit or running through, is that violence? Is, is, it viol is any physical sport violence? Of course mm -hmm. not. Physical contact sport is a game that's played in football or in boxing, whatever it may be. It's a physical contact sport. That doesn't equate with violence, per se. It's the, it's the unlawful attitude that's taken by some of the individuals. That's violence. I mean, there's nothing you, wrong with those sort of attitudes. That attitude is the aggression that you have when you go to hit a golf ball. You're going to smash that golf ball <laughs> and smash it right out of the world. That's the same, like that. kind of, <laughs> the same kind of uh, aggression that you're, you're, express, you're expressing there. The fellow may be saying, that's my attitude. What he's trying to do is get wickets, as was said over here. The point being that simple uh, contact in physical context doesn't equate with violence. One point I want to make very quickly, mm. that the sport that happens to go off the sports field and on his way home gets involved in a brawl. Is that sport? Not, that, that brawl in the rugby pen wasn't sport. That was the same as the guy going home and getting involved with a fight with his wife, maybe. Yeah, That's that sport violence. Yes, uh, Peter, I'm a school teacher and also I play him at a footy and I coach footy. Um, I've brought some kids along uh, tonight that I coach and um, I love the game, but I'm very worried that we still have this attitude in Australian society that you must even up. And I think it's, uh, without trying to sound too idealistic, we must have more of this attitude and it must be promoted by parents, coaches and teachers of if somebody hits you, you basically turn the other cheek, get on with the game, play, play the best game you've ever played. I've been brought up to play that way and I don't think we need any more in Australia this uh, even up attitude. I think you've just got to go on with it and that, that's the way to play sport to play sport properly. Right, uh, uh, good, good point. Terry O'Sullivan, you, you're also working with young That's people. Terry, oh, I beg your pardon, sorry. <laughs> um, you to make related point? to that, uh, nobody I uh, would uh, deny that uh, vigour within the rules is part and parcel of contact sports. And uh, Phil's made the point before that these 1v1 incidents are isolated. But the skirmishes that Peter Quinn referred to and that appear to be part and parcel of particularly the finals games here in Melbourne, they are part of an entertainment which is publicised via the media. My concern from a physical education point of view is that children 
can't tell the difference and they don't know that the coaches are saying if there's any trouble there you go in and you fly the flag hold the flag and support your mates and they see it as a melee they see it as part and parcel of the game and we as physical educators are concerned well it seems to happen at a very early age because uh, Brian Stoddart's written a book called Saturday Afternoon Fever and he in that book cites uh, some studies it was a student study actually done in Western <coughs> Australia and they looked at some junior sporting teams and that study quoted uh, it was a direct quote from one of the mothers on the sideline and she s shouted the advice to her son kick him between the legs that'll slow the little bastard down now that's a mother on the sidelines to her son in a junior game that attitude seems to be reflected by the seniors later on. Peter, has anyone asked the people on the committee how many of them are for contact sports and how many are, are against? against? It's a good, good question. What do you mean, Ron? Well, Peter well, Quinn, do you want to answer this? Yes, um, Peter. Peter Quinn is I on the there national is. committee. Like there's nine of him, actually. Nine to one, fair enough. I'd like to answer it with a question and, and say uh, this, that um, if these attitudes in the community at large don't exist, why is it that the media portrays things like um, Australia versus West Indies, Australia versus England, in this gladiatorial context. And my uh, assessment of it is that because it is known to be popular, this is why people go to some of these matches. Certainly, uh, They know the there's question. going to be violence there and they get a hype from it. You certainly haven't answered the question, Philip. And also, they, they say the same things occasionally, they write the same way about, say, a tennis match where two guys are one-on-one, -on -one, they can't hit each other, not even, well, they dodge all, all the balls anyway. Uh, and they, they say it's a gladiatorial uh, contest. And they say that because of the energy and the person who knows his sport or her sport just loves that feeling of contest. So it can, the gladiatorial attitude can be in a non-contact sport as well, you know. I think that's, um, uh, that's a myth because uh, it's Ooh. based on the idea that... Um, uh, that body contact sports are good for character building. Originally training for war, this was the whole idea. I think that's an absolute myth. What it's much more productive in terms of character building for uh, other sports where the athlete is competing against himself. I, I mean, I mean that, that's, that, that is the whole point here, I think, isn't it? Are we talking about aggression, natural aggression? Are we talking about something that's good for character <coughs> development? Are we talking about something that's excessively yeah, violent? Five-year-old kids out in the park, they wrestle and bump each other and they just love it. What's, what's this guy talking tackling. about? It's very un a very unglamorous part of the game, tackling, isn't it? But if you ask players to tackle, they're doing the menial task rather than the brilliant thing, and, and that's really all about cooperative endeavour. And Peter, was, was this report issued by people that are pro or anti-physical contact? That was a question Ron asked. Yes. We well, Judy Dixon, an you tell us, because you're on the committee too. I think that's very hard to answer. A mixture of people. There are a group of people. I don't think we ever sat down and asked each other whether we're pro or Well, I or think it should have been asked in the first place. Contact spot. We're looking at violence in the whole community, and we focus particularly at one time on I violence I think you should look at the media who... who put Where up these things and blow them up and repeat them. It just oh. puzzles me that so many sports people here uh, are defending violence when there are so many wonderful aspects to yeah, yeah. physical sport. The mm. courage, the fearlessness, yeah. the team spirit uh, and all those good. skills good. which, which, which people have spoken violence. about. It just sort of puzzles me that the violence uh, is unnecessary. It is against the rules. I agree. Judy, the in it, just, in I, physical somebody up the back has been trying to make a point and they're getting left physical out. Physical contact sport, there are... I, yes. I think with the Commission, I think the people who are in the Commission should have a direct link to the sport being played. I mean, I played football in the 16... Australian rules in the 16 to 18 year old, and I've taken knocks, and I don't accept that, but I realise it's a part of it. And I think people in the Commission should be closely related to the actual physical contact sport, rather than Absolutely. looking at the videos and saying, that's not good, we've got to stop it. But look, tell me about this sort of feeling of aggression that uh, people involved talk about. I mean, do you really go out there to fight World War III? But fairly, controlled aggression, like that's what is instilled in us, controlled aggression, not raising your elbow, but giving someone a good bump that's fair and within the rules. All right, how do you give someone a good bump that's fair and in the rules? <laughs> you I mean, you're either giving them one or you're not. I mean, that's not football. You don't lift your elbow. Football's, about, <laughs> football's a game of skill, it's not about knocking But it's a skill. Uh, giving a bump is a skill. OK, look, I think our time's running out here, and I do want to talk about... Well, I suppose we've got to talk about solutions. What do we do about it? I mean, a lot of you certainly aren't accepting that we have a problem with violence in sport. I understand that. Oh, I do. But you do I accept, do. Rod. You I accept do. that we've got a problem, we've got to do something yes. about it. So then the committee is saying there is a, that sport can't be above the law.
that you have to apply the law equally and the law should be involved if you're going to get cases of, of violence that would be prosecuted anywhere else. It philosophically, that is so. Well, but it's not philosophically, it is the law. Mm. Why, it's the actual law. Why would having the, the state involved change things? Because having the state, well, I mean, increasing penalties is not necessarily a deterrent against crime. So you're saying that if you bring the police in, that will stop what you call criminal activities. It hasn't done it so far. No, the committee is just saying, let the law apply equally on the sporting field like it does anywhere else. Now, Ron, you, you weren't well, finished. Well, surely everybody in the world wants to keep the state out as much as practicable. And I'm saying, let's have a, another go at it, or mm. a continuing go at it, an increasing go at it, as we are, because we're all frightened of uh, the clean mm. sports. Mm. Let's give us a few more years and then have a, another look. That's what I say. Be a bit practical. Mm. Uh, Roy, you make the point very effectively in a, in a, in a report that you gave to uh, a committee in Victoria that the sporting bodies simply have been incapable in many cases of, of, of policing the, the violence. I mean, you, you actually cited some specific examples you'd seen at a soccer game. Yeah. Just, just give us one or two of those so we know what you're talking well, about. Well, just to take the point about officials and the sport, we've had three games is, of soccer recently abandoned because officials set upon players. <laughs> now, there, there is your, the dimension of your problem at the, the local and junior level. I mean, I take all the points that are being made up, up at the top level. Mm. These things have changed over the years. That's I think rubbish. sport has become less violent yeah. at, at the top level because partly of a change in community attitudes. Mm. Down at the, at the lower levels, the, the sports at the moment are incapable of policing successfully. And I think we do need a new balance. And that's really what I'm saying, that, that at, at the local level, you need a different balance from the one we have at the moment, which may mean the sanctions of the law being more apparent. But the problem is if you go too far, then you'll lose all that voluntary support that you've got because the support at the, at the local level depends on voluntary activity, right? And if you drive these people out of the game because they're afraid that the penalties will be too great or that the costs of civil action will be too great, you'll lose your sport. And as I say, the code should be worried because at the junior and local level, there are signs already that the sports are fragmenting at the bottom. And if you don't have the kids coming through, you're not going to have senior sport. Give us an track. example of just one of these incidents that you saw with your own eyes in which the referee didn't pick it up, nothing happened, it just passed unnoticed. Well, um, pro probably the, the, the easiest one is last week where um, a father disagreeing with a decision of, of um, the, uh, the, the referee took his kid home at half time, leaving the team short, and they lost the game in the second half. <laughs> Peter Russell, you're, uh, you're, not, you're not just representing the Soccer Federation, you're an ex-policeman. How do you feel about this? Well, I don't see how police can become involved in something unless they become specialists and uh, experts in the particular sport that they're watching, because uh, you know, the rules of, and the law of assault is very uh, delicate. I mean, I can threaten you to punch you and stand next to you and threaten to punch your face and that's from here it's not an assault but if I'm standing next to you it's an assault um, how are these uh, police going to know unless they're experts in particular codes what's within the rules what they're allowed to do or not and how you know I can, the mind boggles when you think that the, you might see one grand final one day where the policeman decides that he, he makes a decision he sees a punch thrown in a scrum and uh, decides to to go in and uh, uh, arrest the person. Does he go in or does he leave him on the field to commit more offences? You know, he's got a big choice to make. How do you cope with a practical problem like that? I don't find too? any great difficulty in, find, in, in finding an assault when someone, indeed an assault and battery, when someone actually physically lands a blow. That is undoubtedly assault and battery but in anyone's language. But are we going to have a situation where police will be running onto the sporting field to pick up players who they think have committed an offence? Yes, yeah, sorry, you've been trying to say something. <laughs> Thanks for giving me a voice. I, I can go back 50 years in uh, VFL and, and I feel the skill in football has gone out a lot. I can go, go back to chicken small. But, but I'm a father of a boy who was injured, believe it or not, to my amazement, on the cricket field by another player, an opposing player. He was dumped and had his arm broken and the son refused to apologise and when I rang up the mother of the son she said, oh well, it's happened to all my sons and she had four. Three of them have had broken arms playing cricket. That, that was their level of violence. I'm afraid there's a VFL whitewash going on tonight and much as I admire Ron Barassi and some of the others, I really feel there's a coordinated VFL <coughs> whitewash. And uh, having loved VFL football, I don't think the VFL administrators know how it's coming across on our media to our youngsters. 
Yeah, it's interesting. It's not only a VFL whitewatch, perhaps, as you suggest. The VFL wasn't even prepared to come along and talk about it tonight. I don't know whether they're just being arrogant or scared or well, both. Well, but well, I think it's interesting that they the VFL, Peter. Yeah, why wouldn't they come and along? I, I, I'm not answering for the administration, but as a director, I can tell you, we do more for the, for the development of youth in this state than any other single body. Are you sure, Leon? We have 35 people out there teaching junior administrators and football That's coaches how to coach best. Yep, but look, and the point, the point is, them. are the sporting bodies, we're not just talking about VFL or league or union or what, but are the sporting bodies generally capable of policing for themselves? Oh, yes. Look, it's been proven. This committee, whoever they are, haven't made one reference to the improvement that all of us universally have acknowledged has happened in the last 10 years. There is less violence now than there was 10 years ago. It's well administrated. We've got, we've got uh, tribunals that look after. We've got officials running out of our officials. And what they want to do, their simple answer, is to put another official that happens to have a, a, a uniform on to help out. It's just nonsense. All right, I've got to wrap this up here. I'll take one last comment from Rex Mossop and one last comment from a member of the committee. How about that? Rex Mossop. Yeah, well, first of all, if you get the police involved, you're going to have trouble in rugby league because half the players are policemen themselves. <laughs> <laughs> we might have... It'll be... Uh, the, and referees, yes. There might be a problem in that area. I suggest that people that don't like violent <laughs> sport don't watch it. And those that do, do watch it. But, uh, you know, I, I find it reprehensible that I've told you categorically figures of numbers of players that have been sent off the field in the 23 players in, out of the 700 that played in the Winfield Cup competition. It's absolutely ridiculous to, and, uh, to expect that the game could be any cleaner. It's squeaky clean. All Believe right. me. Well, Judy Dixon, just a final comment from you. I mean, how do you feel as a result of everything that you've heard tonight? Thanks, Peter. I think uh, on the point of the law being involved, as Neville pointed out, the law already does exist and some players are using the law. So that is nothing new. The committee is not proposing anything new. We're simply saying perhaps that's the way it ought to be in the future. The committee proposes several other strategies uh, which I would recommend to people to look at and discuss. I believe this discussion paper is very important. The issue won't go away. The community are concerned about it and there is a large level of hypocrisy in those that believe that violence in the sports field is okay but uh, it's pretty I dreadful. I suppose what the committee else. really is doing, just to summarise, is to put the sporting bodies on notice. She's saying, look, the, the community is mm. concerned. If you don't clean up your act, the community will have the police go in to clean it up for you. Now, I'm sorry we can't take it any further.